Welcome to The Individual Animal, a podcast about dogs, people, and animal sheltering. I'm your host, Nikki Yukum, here with my co-host, Bernice Clifford. How you doing, Bernice? I'm doing great, Nikki. How you doing? I'm good. I always feel weird saying I'm the host because we're both hosts, but then I'm like, co-host? That that makes sense, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Cause okay. You're the one that you're, um, I wouldn't know how to use the system if you weren't here. So you are the host. <laughs> you are also the host, but I think it would be weird to say, and my other host. Anyway, I always think about that when I say it. But um, yeah, what do we got going on? Uh, do we want to do like a quick what, what we're doing yeah, before we get know, into our guest today? Yeah, I was actually thinking about an update also on, I, I know um, we have a lot of things going, but... Um, an update on our adopt a pet info. Remember, we talked about that, and then we changed the breed labels on our dogs to um, different things on their list, and then um, we changed them back to mixed breed dogs. Yeah, and I think um, we should let people know that we're we're giving it a little bit more time. I think when we did it. Uh, wasn't like the best time around the holidays. We didn't really see any change. But, um, we have someone coming up that's going to talk about uh, just removing labels in their shelters. And that's not until like mid-March. And we'll have more data on the breed label stuff. And then we can maybe on that podcast, we can talk to about um, our Adopt-A-Pet, like final final thoughts on that. But as of right now, we haven't Great. seen a difference. So that's just so you guys know, we didn't for- completely forget about that conversation. <laughs> Oh, back in. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're also doing um, more consulting. Um, shelter consulting. We are just starting with a, another shelter in New York. Yeah, next Tuesday we get started with that. So that's yeah. really exciting. And then, yep. Um, and then we are working hopefully with a shelter in South Carolina. That's at the beginning stages. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I think that's exciting stuff. Um, and that's kind of part of what the next podcast is about, right? Sort of um, collaborations and uh, shelter consultations. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of like my vision for this podcast is to talk to people like we we're, we're talking to um, this coming episode. Um, so let's just tell people what is that who, who's on for today um, who's on? and then it's we'll talk about yeah <laughs> so we have on this particular episode we're chatting with Trish McMillan who has a who's been on the pod before she has a master degree in animal behavior um, and is a certified professional dog trainer um and we're going in depth with her on this podcast about our shelter consulting program but the fun part, too, is that we're going to be joined by Dakin Humane Society's behavior coordinator, Lauren Rubin, who was, in Trisha's words, um, her star student. So we're getting to hear from somebody that has done, like, gone through a shelter consulting course um, and get to hear her experience with that and then her experience um, after and 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 what she's accomplished since then, which is really fun. Yeah. At the end of it, um, I I have been thinking about who on our team should go, honestly. Like, I loved everything she said. I loved the collaboration um, that you'll hear about with the, the folks that take the class and how they collaborate later. Um, and they collaborate with other folks that had previously taken the class. So it's just like this big community of shelter folk across the country who find ways to work together yeah i wanted to send every every single one of our staff um <laughs> i was like can i go <laughs> like, i don't know why but i just want to be on that facebook group they talk about but um I, it would be i think beneficial for every shelter to send at least one of their their people to um based on on how uh, Trish and Lauren described the program. So I hope that you guys enjoy listening to Trish and Laura. Um, and hopefully we have more uh, similar type podcasts. And if you want to talk about your experience in sheltering, please reach out to us. The information is in the show notes. We want to hear from all different shelters across the country and hear what they're doing. So please reach out to us as well. Yep. 
All right. Enjoy the episode. Great. Trish, I think we should get started by talking about your shelter consulting program and then kind of loop us into how Lauren fits into all of that. <laughs> sure, sure. I have, um, since I left the ASPCA about a decade ago, I have been doing shelter behavior consulting. So helping shelters with whatever they need for their programs. Um, sometimes I go in and do a whole revamp where I go through the ASV guidelines and we look at what areas I can help them with and I send them to other people if it's something that um, that they need other than behavior help with and I have been speaking at conferences but my favorite thing is coaching new shelter trainers or maybe not so new shelter trainers and giving them the tools so essentially my shelter I run shelter behavior hub which has education in everything behavior related to shelters and the flagship program are the shelter behavior mentorships. I've got one for dogs and one for cats. And the thing that I found, like I was a shelter behavior person for many years and you guys have probably seen this too. We're all making it up. Like we go through <laughs> our dog training career, however we launch that and then we go into sheltering and it is a whole different kettle of fish from <laughs> puppies to sit or teaching dogs to not yell at other dogs on leash when they're living in a home. And there's nobody to help you. Like you are just making stuff up. There are a couple of online groups, but I've been really working to create a community and we have hundreds of people now who have been through my courses and I love how my students help each other. So Lauren's one of my star students from a few <laughs> a few years ago and um, I was really impressed with what she's been able to do so I have invited her to come on and talk about what she's been able to do boots on the ground in the field. Yes. So Lauren how did you learn about Trisha's program? Um, so I was a baby dog trainer who had been working in private training and then got hired at a shelter I had previously worked at in marketing went and got certified as a trainer decided I missed sheltering got in there as the behavior coordinator and realized they had no idea what I was doing um, and I knew about Trish because of Pibbling with Theodore. <laughs> Had been following Theo for years since I'd gotten my pit bull um, and saw that she offered this mentorship and was like, this is probably going to make a huge difference in what I'm trying to do. Because like Trish said, no one's guiding you. The expectation from, you know, the shelter managers when I came in is that I would just know what to do and how to fix things. And as Trish said, shelter work with homeless animals is very very different from even behavior work with animals that are loved and already have someone who's dedicated to helping them. So it, uh, it helped a ton in a variety of ways that I'm sure we're going to get into, but that mentorship changed my life. <laughs> I, I always, At least as far as work goes. <laughs> I always tell people starting the mentorship, especially if you're in a situation where Lauren was in, where you're just starting shelter uh, work after regular dog training, I said, I, I tell them, I'll make you look good. Like we will give you the tools to do your job really well and to help as many dogs as you can. Mm -hmm. I was working at a different shelter at the time uh, than the shelter I'm currently at. And I credit Trish with the reason I got the job that I have now. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. it's a good there are a lot of perks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love how my students help one another out. Like if somebody's got a job available and you guys know each other from taking the course together or from communicating on, on one of my groups. It's really cool when we help each other out, whether it's with SOPs or whether it's with jobs or whether it's with making our own jobs easier. It's, um, it's very cool. And I, I love being the spider in the middle of the web, just making the connections. That's my favorite thing. So I'm so glad that you were able to get that new job and um, sounds like things are going really well. Amazing. We're glad it. too, because we just realized she's only two hours from us. <laughs> so I can't wait to get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your experience when you first got to uh, where you were? And then we'll get into like you going into into Trisha's uh, program and what things changed from there. But let's just get started with like where you were at before you uh, right before you went to to did you go um, or did you do like a virtual? Because I know you do both. Right, Oops. Trish? Yeah, uh, Lauren's yeah. just done my virtual program, okay. so and and I've it actually found it more effective 
than shelter behavior consulting. I mean, I love going in person, and often I'll train people in defensive handling or whatever they need training in. And if I do a full consult, I would give them a list of here's your low-hanging fruit that you can change, here's some sort of mid-range goals, here's some long-range goals, but please review this every year. And um, I have found that with the turnover being so high in sheltering, I've been back to the same shelter before and said, hey, have you looked at my report from last time? And everybody's new except like one person. <laughs> my report is still sitting on a stack of reports. Whereas if it, if the change comes from within, if I'm helping somebody like Lauren who is in there, we have contact for 13, 14 weeks mm -hmm. over the mentorship and we touch base every week on our Zoom meetings, we work on SOPs, we work on bringing the shelter as close to best practices. And I have actually found that model with somebody inside the shelter doing their own consult, far more effective in changing big programs. Because even, I'm sure even after you left your shelter, Lauren, there were some things, some changes that you made that will carry on, that's your legacy. Yeah, that reminds I hope so, me anyway. a lot of um, our internship programs that we used to host here at the farm, just to follow those humans throughout their careers and the changes that they make when they leave the farm and then when they move on to a different organization, which I'm going to assume Lauren's going to have a similar story uh, to share. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, like, where was I at the time? So I think it was 2020, which was a year of experiences. Um, yeah, sure. I think I started at my shelter in late 2019 and then COVID hit. Um, so like I said, I had come from being a baby dog trainer. I just gotten certified through Karen Pryor, just got my CPDT. Um, had previously worked in marketing at the shelter, but not in behavior. Missed sheltering, decided I would come back, and then everything changed with COVID. So I stepped in as a baby dog trainer who had never done shelter behavior to a program that shifted dramatically away from what it had been. The shelter in Oregon I was working at hadn't had a behavior coordinator for a few years, so everything was outdated. They just moved into a brand new building. There were no protocols for where we were at. I felt very overwhelmed. And when I found Trisha's program, decided that, you know, I pitched it to the director. She agreed to pay for it so that I could take it. And it literally step by step led me through how to rebuild or essentially just build a program from scratch, which was huge. I left that shelter with tons of standard operating procedures in place. Like if I had gotten hit by a bus, Trisha's program made it so someone else should just be able to slot right into my position without missing a beat. We had adoptability criteria on what kind of animals we do and don't place. Um, everything from how to clean kennels to how to safely defend yourself from animals that are unsafe. Um, I mean, it really, I left them with a complete and entire program because of Trisha's help, which was huge. Yeah, That's and it's, it's typical, too, for shelters to have nothing written down. Like, they might have SOP for <laughs> yeah. cleaning, but as far as behavior goes, like, there's no, there's no manual. And that's what I want people to do is write down what you're doing and leave it for the next person. And they can change it if they find a, a way they like better. But at least you've got something to start with because so many of us are just flailing. Yep. Do, you offer, um, do you offer some of those, like, outlined things um, without taking the course or is that something that you get when you take the take the course there I am working on getting chunks of the course up as standalone but um, it's certainly not the I don't think I'll ever put the full course online because one piece at a time because it, it really is a holistic experience you make yeah. your own plan you follow yeah. through but for example I have a course on intake for dogs because I think that's a place where many of us could be doing better and getting a good behavioral history and doing pathway planning from there. So there, there are chunks of it online and I will continue putting chunks of, of um, both the dog and cat mentorships online, but being with the group, like it becomes therapy by the end. We all get, no. <laughs> sure. I love that. And, and friendships are made and we often trade dogs from one shelter to the other. And I, I think your shelter did some of that, didn't, didn't you, Lauren? Yeah, uh, Mason is one of the people that I took the class with who's in Texas and we still message each other fairly regularly. <laughs> Um, I've been trying to get him to move to Massachusetts. <laughs> like, you know what's great? It's New England. Um, I know you have a swimming pool in your backyard, but would you like to come to the snow? Uh, but Mason and I actually set up a 
a swap at my last shelter where he sent the dogs up to us, including one of my absolute favorite dogs of all time, Big Papa, who still has a special place in my heart. Um, and it was really cool getting to physically work with a dog that my friend in Texas had worked with and continue the training program that he'd implemented for Big Papa to get Papa adopted. It was, I like got chills. I was like, Mason, I'm sitting with a dog that you sat with. And Mason and I would never have met if it weren't for Trisha's course. And we still exchange SOPs on the regular. I'm like, I just wrote this one. Do you want to see it? He's like, hey, I was thinking about this. What are you doing? And it's super helpful. Nice. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> um, so you, when did you leave um, your shelter in Oregon? So I left my shelter in Oregon. It must have been December of 2020. I was there for about a year and a half. Um Trish has a section on compassion fatigue at the end of her course and always warns people when you take it that you may realize some things about your shelter that may need processing, I guess is maybe a polite way to put it. And after I took that course, I was like, oh, (laughs) I'm not in a healthy work environment. This is an unhealthy culture for me. I'm actually really struggling in a way that I don't think I realized. So I ended up after trying to adjust some changes, I worked with my manager, tried to work with the director and realized that we were just on very different um, perspectives on humane euthanasia, what's adoptable, not adoptable. And no one wants to have to advocate for euthanasia in animals and have it be a fight. But we were placing animals that were flat out dangerous that I knew were going to hurt other animals or people. And then I was the one talking to these adopters being like, I'm sorry that your dog is trying to kill your neighbor's dog. I knew this was going to happen and it's heartbreaking. And when you bring that dog back, I don't have any other options. And it was awful to have to do that. And so I left when I realized that that wasn't going to change. And I actually was like, I think I'm done with sheltering. That was really traumatic. It was too hard. And I know a lot of other people have that experience. And then um, my husband's from Massachusetts. We wanted to move here eventually. And Trish posted the job posting at the shelter I work at now and said, I know the director, this program is in line with all the things that we talk about, about how we should only be placing safe companion animals. And I had my interview and was like, I can move in September. It's May. And they said, yes, I've been, uh, it'll be a year since I started remote in uh, June. And I have had the same length of time I did at my last shelter. And at this point in that last shelter, I was burnt and done. And now I'm like, I am so fresh. I have so much energy. We're making waves. We're doing stuff. Um, The difference is huge. And if Trish hadn't recommended I try for this job, I probably wouldn't have. And I I am hoping I'm going to put 10, 20 years in at this place. It's incredible what a difference having a place that's safe, easy to talk to people, And all of that I learned, like when I did my interview, I was like, I'm going to ask questions that I know Trish recommends asking. What's the culture like? What are your euthanasia policies? It made a huge difference. I got off the interview and was like, if I don't get this job, I will cry. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, huge difference. Yeah, I cannot tell you how much happier I am. Yeah, you have you have to be compatible with the culture, and and I'm sure there are people who are okay with the culture at your old place, and you were the mm-hmm. right fit for your new place. And I've had people take the course and realize that just they themselves had some compassion fatigue and they needed a break from the field entirely, and that's that's why I have the module in the course because um, we we got to take care of ourselves too. I love when a plan comes together. I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> One of my students got the job. I, I know a few a few applied, and you were the winner. So you, you were our student, and you deserve a, you deserve a great place to land. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy. And like you said, people do well at my last shelter. It just wasn't a good fit for me and what my core belief system is uh, in a way that my new shelter is. It just worked out perfectly, though, for it you. It did. I mean, I'm haunted, guys. It's incredible. <laughs> I want to keep good people like Lauren in the business. Like it would have been a real loss to the field if you had decided to, I mean, it would have been great for the puppies that you might've trained in puppy class. (laughs) Keeping dogs out of shelters is important too. Sometimes that's the right fit for people, but I'm glad sheltering got to keep you. (laughs) Yes, me too. I really like it. I, I ran my own behavior business for a while and was helping people that shelters were placing dogs that probably were an interesting decision to place. 
And uh, now that I'm back in sheltering, it's so much, I wouldn't say it's ever easy to make a recommendation one way or the other, but it helps a lot to be able to see the people I've helped in private practice and be like, no one needs to go through some of these things or yeah, the leash reactivity looks awful, you guys, but it's totally workable in a home. Don't even worry about it and be able to recommend (laughs) one way or the other and be like, no, no. And I know what to do so I can send adopters with our standard operating procedure on how do you work on leash reactivity um, and be able to help in a way that I don't think I could have helped if I hadn't had both skill sets, which has been really cool. Great. Um, Trish, who would you recommend take your course? Who is the target audience for you? Yeah, I have I have had more and more people coming from rescue groups, which is not what the course was designed for, but we can certainly flex to um, to help rescues. And I am finding sometimes the smaller groups like that, we can make huge changes because they're starting with even less than a shelter. They often don't have a facility. So, um, but Lauren's kind of the ideal candidate where you've just finished your dog training um, apprenticeship or course and you really want to go into shelters and you might have already got a job or maybe you want to get a job in a shelter and you're just sort of thrown in and what do I do now like that that is ideal so but I've also had a lot of volunteers take the course and I started off as a volunteer I was not paid for my first several years in sheltering Right, and, most people. <laughs> yeah, people. and it is amazing what one nosy volunteer can accomplish because their shelters <laughs> are understaffed. They are scrambling. Volunteers are often the stopgap that we need. And if your volunteer sits down and writes you an entire enrichment program and puts up the whiteboards and, and um, organizes other volunteers to create the enrichment, like the thing I tell volunteers is If you go into a shelter and say, you should be doing this, you should have an enrichment program, you should have a playgroup program, you should do this, be better. (laughs) We'll get the wall because we are all overworked, we are stretched to the limit, we are understaffed. But if you go and you say, hey, notice the dogs could use a little more enrichment, would you like me to train? And that's how I started in sheltering was I trained I put an ad in the paper, the shelter put an ad in the paper, and I trained 10 volunteers a week in dog walking because the dogs were getting nothing. They were just in the kennels. And it doesn't seem like much, but at the end of the year, I had trained 500 people in dog walking. And not everybody stayed. Some people came in and got covered in poop and were like, no, no, no. But, uh, (laughs) But, you know, one nosy volunteer and the volunteers built a fenced yard so we could have play groups. This was in the 90s. This was, um, we put together remote adoption. The volunteers would load up the dogs and take them to the pet store and put them in X-Pens. And um, it, it was all done with volunteer labor. We did not have a behavior person. So that's, that's what I tell the volunteers is, don't go in and say, you do it. <laughs> go in and say, how can I help? Would you like me to look at your SOPs? Would you like me to, to write down what people are doing so you have a training manual? And um, yeah, so a, a wide variety. Sometimes it's people who just want to get into sheltering um, my favorite combos are when the executive director or the ops director takes the course along with their behavior person because a struggle that my students have is, okay, my eyes have been open. <laughs> we need to have <laughs> SOPs. We need to have play groups. We need to have enrichment. And you go to your boss and you're like, hey, can we get some training in for play groups? And they're like, no. <laughs> now, now you know what you should be doing. And you don't know, but if I if I have both people in the course at the same time, and I can explain, this is why you need enrichment. This is why you need play groups. Um, I've been using the Animal Farms um, enrichment handbook for a long time in my course. <laughs> but what, if if I have them both at the same time, I find it's easier to get cooperation, and it's easier to really accelerate the changes that that need to happen. That's awesome. I love the volunteer aspect of it because, and I'm just um, speaking on a personal level, but I would imagine with the high turnover rate that there is in sheltering right now, like volunteers mm-hmm. stick around for a very long time. So that's like you're really su- supporting your organization when you're sending your volunteers to this course because they'll probably be around for quite a while. I know our volunteers are. Yeah, and the volunteers almost all self-fund. It is very, I don't think I've ever had a shelter like, here's my chief volunteer, let me pay for you. 
So, you know, kudos to those folks who go yeah. above and beyond and um, they, they have been able to make some incredible changes and sometimes they get hired by the shelter once they've created the program. <laughs> do. It was really neat to be in a shelter employee who was coming into a program where it was like we had some senior volunteers that had been there for years that were basically keeping it afloat as much as they could, but they were only coming in once or twice a week. And so then to step in, not know how to build a volunteer program, having been a volunteer way back and then take Trisha's course, there's a whole segment that just walks you through start to finish. How do you recruit volunteers? What are the things you need? How do you train volunteers? How do you enlist other volunteers to help you train volunteers? And so I was able to build a whole volunteer program during the course when I was with Trish and bring it to our senior volunteers and say, will you guys help me execute this? And they totally stepped up. And I know at least a few of them are still at my last shelter in Oregon training new volunteers. The other really cool part was I got to bring all of that with me to my new shelter. And so I stepped in and it had same situation. COVID had hit. A lot of volunteers had left. The behavior coordinator had left a couple of years ago. And I was able to come in and be like, with Trisha's help, I've already built a volunteer program once before. Let's do it again. The other really nice part about the continuing, I'm so I'm still on Trisha's Facebook group. And it's been really neat being able to post there and get help, but also to watch others post there, including get the volunteer perspective. Because it's been a really long time since I was a volunteer at a shelter. And so being able to get their perspective and be like, I remember what it's like to not be paid staff and to feel important and to want to feel important and find ways to really include people so they feel good about it when they're not getting paid to do it. It's been really inspiring. And some of the volunteers that post stuff, I'm like, man, I should do a better job as a paid employee. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's impressive. It's impressive what volunteers can do. Like, I, It's something I realized when I was at the ASPCA shelter in New York City that we had three levels of dogs. We had the green dogs that anybody can walk, the blue dogs who are a little more jumpy mouthy, and then we had the red dogs that were staff only. And I would see these staff members come on, very, very junior, straight out of high school, straight out of college, young, young people. And they're like, yeah, I had a bulldog at home when I was a kid. And now they are walking the red dogs two weeks in after shadowing somebody. Ouch. <laughs> meanwhile, I've got volunteers. Some of them are professional dog trainers. Some of them have been walking our dogs for 15 years. And I thought, this is a skill set that we need. So I created the Red Dogs Volunteer Program and I taught them some higher level skills. That's the basis of the defensive handling that I teach now. They need to know how to get out of a pickle if one of these dogs gets over aroused on a walk. And uh, I am super proud of the Red. Then we had to create a, a new level of yellow dogs for <laughs> that <laughs> new staff only that were on bike quarantine or something. Um, but my red dog volunteers did such an, cause those are the dogs who need the work the most and they were getting the least cause they were staff only. And I'm really proud to say that a number of my red dog volunteers went on to become professional dog trainers. Like it was a really good, you will not get a better training than from shelter dogs. Yeah. That's how I became a behavior person. I volunteered at the shelter and was like, what's the weird stuff though. <laughs> I'm really excited. That's actually the program I'm building right now is we also have, we have the red dogs and then we, we now have black dogs, which are me and like two other staff members. But uh, that's the program I'm currently and most excited to work on is we call them mod squad volunteers. They wanted a cool superhero name, um, <laughs> but they're the ones that are going to go in with these younger roused dogs that are, you know, biting clothes and stuff like that and be able to work them the way that a professional trainer would. And having that skill set is huge. So I can't wait. I'm hoping to launch that March 1st at my new shelter. So, Yay. <sighs> nice. but it's literally the same program I built with Trish the last round. I'm like, here we go again. <laughs> they can be your best it's a helpers. Gift that keeps and they, getting. Like make an army of mini me's. And the other advantage is rather than you and two other staff members handling, you can get that generalization that is so important. Like it's not just Lauren and two other people who are good. It, it could be anybody. Yeah, it's Lauren huge. It's also exciting to get to handpick those guys and be like, you're such a good volunteer. Let me reward you by giving you these weird dogs to work with because something is broken in you the way it is broken in me that makes you like weird dogs. <laughs> Perfect. That's who we need. That's who we need in shelter. Yeah. You mentioned a Facebook group. Is that like for the people that? Yeah, it is. It is only for people who have taken the course. I do not want to try to instruct every. Um, right. There, there yeah. are other groups for for shelter training in general, but my yeah. my group is my school is on Thinkific, and the Thinkific chat 
feature is not as great. And if I ever move off Thinkific, I want to I want to hang on to my my students. So I've got a Facebook group that is only for people who have taken the shelter dog mentorship, and now I've got a separate one for the shelter cat mentorship. That's great. I got to do that one next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Starts in August. So I have a question, two, like twofold. One uh, similar questions for both of you. Um, for Trish, what is the um, thing that people are most hesitant towards in your course to to like get involved in and then Lauren what um, things were were your um, colleagues most hesitant in making changes on yeah I think I think what people are concerned about really depends on where their shelter is in terms of um, programs they get people from big fancy shelters who have everything up and going they've got play groups they've got enrichment they've got volunteers and they're sort of finding little things to pick and choose and sometimes when i get those i'm like you're going to be the teacher for this segment you're going to help me teach enrichment because you guys are doing everything right um i think the probably overall the thing people are most scared about is um play groups i think a lot of us come at it from I came from a doggy daycare background, so I am very comfortable with dog play. I think it is amazing. It's my favorite part of sheltering is watching dogs teach other dogs. But a lot of folks, if you've just done KPA online and you have taught your dog a 10 step behavior chain and you haven't been in a daycare with 30 dogs bouncing off each other, like that can be scary. And um, I know you guys know, I've heard it on your podcast <laughs> that Sometimes the most reactive dogs, the dogs who are screaming and flinging themselves at the kennel bar, sometimes they are only doing it because they really want to play with that other dog. And it looks scary to us if we've only had our personal dogs at home. We haven't been in, in we haven't seen a lot of dog play. I find a lot of my students are very hesitant to put any dogs together. And we're like, we'll do play pairs. We won't do play groups and um, sort of coaching them through that. And one thing that's been super helpful is Sometimes if I've got a student within driving distance of another student who's got a robust playgroup program, I'm like, go to Sacramento, <laughs> you know, watch, watch the playgroup program there and people will help one another. I really love how my students help one another because um, we're all working in the dark. So I, I think that I get a lot of pushback. Like, hey, we can't, we can't put them together. I'm like, if you are not testing every one of your dogs off leash with another dog, guess who's going to do it? It's going to be your adopters. Even if you send them right. to an only dog home, it is going to happen on Thanksgiving when Aunt Betty puts her Pomeranian on the living room floor <laughs> because she walked in with it in her coat. You're, there's the dog test. And if you have yep. adopted out a heat-seeking missile who is not re react, but who is going to grab and shake and, and try to kill another dog, this is going to be done at Thanksgiving with people who are not trained in it. Like we, we should know how to do this. It's our job as, as shelter professionals. And if you don't know, it, know how to do dog introductions, go learn from somebody who does. Use a muzzle, use your helper dogs, use barriers, use leash, whatever it takes, but learn how to do it because um, your, your adopters will do it at some point in that dog's life. And, and we don't want Aunt Betty's Pomeranian to be the victim of that. Yeah. What about you, Lauren? Have you had a lot of pushback from with playgroups or anything else? I think that was the thing that I personally had the most trepidation about, um, especially like my own personal dog. First off, I was that adopter at 22. I got my first dog and they were like, I don't know, I think he likes dogs. And I was like, great. And I took him to the dog park and he bit another dog in the butt. <laughs> Fortunately, he was 30 pounds and the boxer that was the victim was like, wow, what's your problem? The lady was very nice. Um, but then my own, my other dog that I adopted got attacked. So I had a lot of trepidation around dog introductions. And at the time that I took Trisha's course in Oregon, I was working at a stray intake shelter where the vast majority of what we took we were going to be unknown entities. So after taking Trisha's class, I was like, okay, Trish talks a lot about like most dog fights are very superficial. They're going to be loud. They're not actually dangerous. And at some point it was like, oh God, we're just going to have to do it. Here we go. Um, <laughs> and just kept trying to do play groups, kept trying to do dog tests, started with barriers, was like, okay, at least no one can get hurt. This is the baby step. Um, and now at my current shelter, we do them and the other staff, I'm like, loose leash guys, deep breath. Nobody's gonna get hurt, gonna be fine. 
let them write it out. <laughs> if in doubt, uh, use a muzzle. It's fine. When in doubt, yep. slap a muzzle on them. Yep. We uh, just rebuilt our play yard. Uh, so we have three little like areas. So now we have airlocks. Um, so it actually was really cool this last week. We had a chocolate lab that was from a transport from the south. They said she did great in playgroups. She got here and she is, I mean, there's frustration reactivity and then frustration aggression. And she is straight up in the, she looks like she will take the life of any creature she sees on leash Oops. or behind a barrier. And I was like, well, they said she was good in play groups, So we're going to have to write it out. And I scared Breathe. the bejesus out of half of my staff members. Yeah. Um, but I put her in behind the airlock. And after about a minute, she started grabbing toys and trying to find something to do that wasn't trying to kill the other dog. And it turns out she is phenomenal at playing with other dogs, like so polite, defers when they give corrections, unreal. Um, oh, and that's awesome. because of Trisha's class, I was like, I know what I'm doing and I can take the chance. And she actually just got adopted by a very nice couple that understand what they're gonna need to do. She played beautifully with their German Shepherd. They have a privacy fence and I was like, all right, if you wanna take her for walks, here's what it's gonna take. So um, if I hadn't taken Trisha's class, I probably would have been like, this dog is gonna kill another dog and we have no options. But instead I knew what I was looking for and was like, all right, we're gonna try it and see what happens. And it was great. So good for Addie. <laughs> but I do think I stress my coworkers out sometimes where I'm like, it'll be fine. Take a deep breath. Don't worry about it. I'm very blasé huh? now. <laughs> it's good for them to see it and learn that. Yes. Things yeah, aren't look, Lauren's not shaken. Like. Everything's fine. What's the worst that happens? You guys, I got my little, yep. you know, I've got the tools that I need to break up a fight if it actually happens. And we've never had one. And now I have volunteers that every Saturday are like, Stop whatever you're doing. It's playgroup time. We need you to lead the playgroup. Let's go. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> so important. So important. What about the most, like, the thing you were most excited to go back and start implement implementing, implementing after um, finishing up the course with Trish? Mm, I think the thing I was most, like, excitable about, I think the thing that was most helpful was probably about our do adoptability criteria, because we didn't have any way to make decisions on what we would consider placeable or not. The thing I was most like excited about was the volunteer program. I have never written SOPs faster in my life than I was like, this is what I'm going to need to implement beginner volunteers, intermediate volunteers and advanced volunteers. Uh, and starting at my at my current shelter, you know, when I was working remote for them before we moved to Massachusetts, I was like, here are all the SOPs I already have. Tell me what you think. How does this match what you're doing? Let's go. Um, and we've onboarded, we do volunteer orientations. We were doing twice a month. Now we're down to once a month, but we onboard 25 new people at these orientations. So it was 50 people a month for a while. Now it's once a month. I have six or seven volunteer mentors that train them one at a time when I'm not there. Um, so we are onboarding so many new volunteers that it's getting overwhelming and it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> How are they coming on so quickly? Is it just word of mouth? Or are you guys really pushing? Is that part of what you're doing is pushing the marketing on it? I think part of what probably helps is that we're the biggest shelter in our area that isn't animal control. Um, so for people who are a little nervous about animals, but really want to get into it, we're seen as like the, the less risky option. Um, you know, if you're into the weird dogs like I am, you're like, I'm going to volunteer at the local animal control, but we pull from the animal control. We mostly take owner surrenders and transfers. So I think it's seen as a, a soft entry point into the world of animal care, but we've also been around for a really long time. So people just know who we are and what we do, which I think helps a lot too. So there's always demand to come into the volunteer program. But before I started, they didn't really have a solid way to onboard people post COVID. It was like, we're just working on a wing and a prayer. So the volunteer coordinator started a couple years before me. And so she and I work, the, she's the manager now. We work really closely together to get this program built at rapid speeds. I swear she has not taken your class, Trish, but it feels like she has. Because I come in and I'm like, here's what I got. And she's like, March 1st launch date. Let's go, people. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so valuable. And volunteers really are the solution to the staffing crisis that many of us are having. Kudos to you for getting all that up and running. It makes my heart happy to hear. And, and the other thing is your shelter has a culture of not keeping unadoptable or dangerous animals in cages for long periods of time. Like there is, there is the culture of this one is not a pet. 
and making decisions promptly rather than um, putting people at risk and that I think and and also the the advanced training is so important with volunteers like keep up that for the volunteers you have bring in local guests bring in you can get a webinar from me and hit play you can now, <laughs> I mean with my volunteers I brought in a groomer once and taught everybody how to brush a dog or brought in a massage person and taught everybody how to touch dogs in ways that dogs like so continue being the shelter that has the advan the training and has the levels that people can work through I think is really really helpful yeah, that's my next big dream once we get the the mod level program launched is to be able to do monthly like we're gonna get together and we're gonna talk about leash reactivity if there's oh. a trainer in town that does tea touch i want to have her come in and show everyone how you do canine massage so i'm i have stuff for that that i did at my last shelter that i really want to do but i have to rein myself in and be like okay let's get enough volunteers let's get the program built <laughs> even if it's just like let's teach the dogs tricks let's teach them to shake a paw teach them to roll over i have long had this opinion that i would love someone to do research on that teaching the dog a stupid trick is more useful than teaching them to sit down stay heel come like mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have seen people's heart melt when you go into the um, the meeting room and the dog walks up and says, pleased to meet you. <laughs> you can just see him like, I knew he was my dog when he chose me. <laughs> we have a really well built program. Whoever's holding the leash, you offer them a paw. But um, I, I suspect that that tricks are a great thing to teach. And that's great advance. If you've done KPA, you know how to teach lots of stuff. We have a really well built out, built out cat program. There's a gal that's been there for a few years that, and I'm learning from her about cats. She's phenomenal. And she built this really great program where they click or train the cats. Yeah. And I swear the number of people I see walk into the cat colony and the first thing that does the cat reaches for them. And they're like, I'm taking nice. that cat home. I mean, he did choose you, but the reality is they trained that cat to do touch. <laughs> he chooses <laughs> but everybody. It's so cute. He, yeah. You cannot walk in there without that cat being like, hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm yours. Yeah, so. But it really wouldn't be, including just showing the videos of them training and people being like, this cat is unreal. It's like, it, I know. I want to take that cat home. <laughs> Yeah, it works for my foster cats too. People are like, "What? What is a trained cat?" I'm like, "Watch them sit." They're like, "Oh, the cat, cat. <laughs> what, what magic is this?" Like, it's, it's clicker training. <laughs> it's yes, it's clicker training. I'm very excited for the day our dog program matches our epic cat program. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got you there. You've got the volunteers, so um, I, I we're getting there. Faith it'll happen. I do kind of want to hear a little bit about the cat program, though. We just talked about dogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about the cats? <laughs> yeah, the Shelter of Cat Behavior Mentorship is built on the same framework. So we start with going through the ASV guidelines, picking out all of... So what you do with the Association of Shelter Veterinarians guidelines is... And anybody can do this. It's available free online. There's a checklist available as well. And we usually use the checklist and we go through and... If you are at ideal on everything, you write down nothing for your program. <laughs> if you are, oh, we're only feeding once a day, it says we should be feeding it twice a day for healthy adult animals. Um, that would go in the low hanging fruit column. So I have people prioritize everything that's not up to speed. Sometimes you go through and there's just one or two small things that are not ideal. But the um, newer the program is, the newer you are to creating a behavior program. And sometimes the things are, medical or cleaning and that's why i ask people to do it with your shelter vet with somebody from operations so they can have their list but we're going to pick out the behavior things and things like feeding that influences behavior it is surprising how much of that list sure. has a behavioral component and i've seen people go from feeding once a day to feeding twice a day and have so much less arousal and so much um, more content animals so nice. you pick out the things that are not quite up to snuff. You have low hanging fruit. That's things we can change tomorrow. We're just going to start feeding twice a day. We have mid range goals, which might be creating a play group program, something that you could do sort of in the next year, if you get the training and get the funding for the play yards. <laughs> and then we have long range goals. Like I, I worked with one shelter that had dirt for the outside of the kennel rather than concrete. So there was no way to completely sterilize it. If you had an outbreak, although they used flamethrowers, which I <laughs> I would love to see it was a volunteer run shelter. And I'm just picturing all of these cute little old ladies with their flamethrowers. Um, 
<laughs> I know my director's gonna listen to this later and she's gonna be like, no, Lauren, and I'm gonna be like, but though. <laughs> what? What? I can give you the name. She's on the group. The person who is, um, ex-military thought of the uh, flamethrowers. But yeah, so, some of the things like we can't properly sterilize until we have concrete on the outside of the runs and that's going to be a long range goal. We'll have to fundraise, we may have to build a whole new shelter. But knowing what is next, and I advise people to revise it. So we do the same thing with the cats. We go through, create the guidelines and the modules and both mentorships follow the animal from intake. And then we do assessment and enrichment. Then we do um, different behavior problems. Then we talk about adoption. And that is a piece that many people really need some help with. I will go and secret shop your shelter. <laughs> be like, okay, could, could I adopt from your shelter? And sometimes I don't have a six foot privacy fence. And uh, some of the rescues are like, if you don't have a six foot privacy fence, forget about adopting X breed from us. I'm like, well, I can't adopt from you. <laughs> I have three and a half acres. It's fenced with four foot um, farm fencing. I did put a fi collar on my Doberman when I adopted her because I know she could jump it from a standstill. She has never chosen to. She realizes she's got it good here. <laughs> but, um, often the adoptable, like we, we take in these animals and then we hold on to them and say, no, nobody can ever adopt them. They have to be just like me. Um, so often we'll, and then we'll work with that and we'll talk about post-adoption support. So I, and we do it over 13 weeks. So we just troubleshoot as we go. We have weekly Zoom meetings. We have the online group. We have homework every week. And you end up with a full set of, if you do all the homework, you end up with a set of SOPs like Lauren had that you can take to your next shelter if you don't stay in one place forever. And um, it's, it's pretty magical. I, I really, really like the program. My favorite part of the week, talking to my students and helping them figure out the way forward. I always see the posts that you're doing your like current week module and I'm like, oh, they miss that. <laughs> and, and you're allowed to comment if you have an SOP that somebody needs. Um, I, I do put post the homework in the full group so that if you are just scanning on by and you see the homework and they're like, ah, I need an SOP for this and you have it. I love how generous everybody is and they share. Mm -hmm. I, feel like I, I posted to take the other the day and was so like, I could be part of this Facebook group. I know. <laughs> the Facebook group. Like, all wait, alone. I want to play. <laughs> yes. I want all these It cool alone friends. is worth the, the, I mean, the whole thing is you get so much bang for your buck. But even years later, I posted the other day and was like, I'm trying to figure out how to do our adoptability criteria when we have low population versus high, because that makes a difference in what we can handle. And I am having a hard time like picturing it. And I have to follow up, but someone commented and was like, remind me, I have something for this and can send it to you. Um, and it, the wealth, the resource, unbelievable, the things, including it's fun to be able to comment on people's things and be like, we went through something similar. Or Mason posted one about a puppy with some serious behavior problems. And I, you know, a year ago, two years ago, had commented and had struggled with something similar with a weird puppy. And Trish was like, you know, where did this end up? What was the outcome? And so seeing other people's case studies is really helpful mm -hmm. when I see weird things. Um, yeah, it's just, it's such a wealth, not only with Trish, but also with shelter people around the world. There was a gal in my unit who was from Singapore. It was really interesting seeing where she was at and the things she was seeing versus what we were dealing with versus what Mason, who's at a 800 dog at, at any given time shelter in Texas, you know, my last shelter, it was 70 dogs was average. My current shelter, it's like we had 18 last week and we were drowning. It's interesting seeing all the different ways that people are doing it and being able to get support and help and to give it back. Yeah, you've all been through the same thing. So you have mm -hmm. that like knowledge, all that knowledge to share with each other. And, and I, I, always, yeah. I always tell um, shelter directors who are considering putting somebody in the course, that this course will pay for itself many times over. If you house a dangerous dog for an extra year, that is nine to $18,000 if you're paying 25 to 50 bucks a day to keep that dog in a cage. And if we can make a decision promptly, if that is a dog who is dangerous and we don't have to try everything and send them to board and train and do this and do that. If you're just like, here's our criteria, we wrote it out in the course, this dog does not meet um, adoptability criteria, that alone, like never mind getting play groups, like how long would that lab have stayed in the shelter mm -hmm. if you were like, oh, she's leech reactive, mm. only dog home, we can't, like as soon as you put yeah. only dog home labels on a dog, they're going to sit there for six months instead of two weeks. 
So um, yeah. it, it does pay for itself many times over for people who take it, never mind the, the great community that we get. How does someone sign up for a class? Um, hop on shelterbehaviorhub.com and get on our ma mailing list. We do um, free chats. I should have you guys come on one of my chats and talk about your great program. Love it. Um, so you get you get access to the free chats. Try, try to do them every two weeks. I've been lax this year, but uh, we will get them back up and going. And. Um, you'll be on the mailing list, so you will see the mentorships come out. I typically have an early bird discount, so if you hop on it as soon as you see the um, course come out, you'll, you may get a better price, but the next, um, the next one starts in May. So the January one is well underway. You can't join that one now. <laughs> that will start at the end of May for dogs, and the cat one will start in August, sort of as kitten season is calming down over here. We will, um, we will launch the cat one. So. Yeah, hopefully Lauren will be on that and uh, would love to see like people who can't afford to do a full consult to have. Like, I'm thrilled to see Animal Farms doing um, in-person consults as well. You guys have so many great materials. I, I like doing in-person consults as well, but if you can't afford that, the course is 600 bucks and it will pay for itself. You, you get 13 weeks of access to me. So that is up to 26 hours of consulting with me and with other people from around the world, which you're, you're not going to get for 600 bucks anywhere else. Right, no. right. <laughs> and no. um, plus all of the materials, you have access to the materials for a year with the option to renew. And some people maintain access for years afterwards and use my modules for training. Like here's Trisha's defensive handling module. We will just mm -hmm. pull up the epic in the boardroom. I will hit play and everybody's going to get trained. So it's, it's great value for the money. Love it. Yeah. Cool. I, mean, I knew you did these courses. And I didn't realize how in depth they were. So I'm so glad we got to chat about them today. Very yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah. Hop on the mailing list and you will hear about all the stuff. And, and I am working on getting modules. Um, I have a great enrichment module that is led by the phenomenal Mick Muller who teaches for the module for my mentorship. He's got some great stuff. Um, he works in Phoenix and I went and saw his program in person when I was in Phoenix. I was like, I am not worthy. I can't teach this. You are doing so much more than what I'm doing. So um, he's got a standalone enrichment module that you can buy. And um, so you, you will hear about all the new stuff coming out as well as when the mentorships start. Very cool. And Lauren, it's can worth you it. just um, let people know where they can scope out your shelter if they want to check out what you're yeah, doing? Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, yeah, if you're in the New England area, stop on by. I'm at Dakin Humane Society. It's D-A-K-I-N-Humane.org. Um, we're in Springfield, Massachusetts, and um, I'm a huge shelter nerd, so if anyone wants to reach out, my email is just lrubin at dakinhumane.org. Let's nerd out. And if you want more personal information on why Trisha's thing is the most worthwhile, um, email me and I'll be like, what more can I say? Um, <laughs> it is totally, I mean, I quote you all the time, Trish. It's weird. I think my director's tired of me being like, well, as Trish would say, we don't need a blood donor. <laughs> <laughs> I, have one, I have one student whose director said she's going to start fining her a dollar every time she mentions the AFC guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for you have you have uh, <laughs> yeah my coworkers are like as Trish McMillan would say <laughs> oh you're a legend <laughs> it's, true. it's crazy to be quoted in Massachusetts <laughs> it's true I, it's so weird to me that I've never actually met you in person Trish my from from years before I even became a shelter person my biggest goal is to meet Theo so Definitely. at least I'm now on the right seaboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's an old man now. You got to come down they to Pumple Hill. Um, I'm, I'm also going to be at Expo this year. Shelter Behavior Hub is going to have a booth there. I'm oh, um, nice. going to be speaking a couple of times, and uh, there will be specials. And, and I'm working on getting some merch. I don't know. We've never had Shelter Ooh. Behavior Hub merch. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's in May. So, if, look, Lauren, talk to your, uh, talk to your director and sending you to Expo. It's a, great, um, it's a great show. It's in Texas. Maybe Mason will come. Oh, I could get to meet Mason and Pri oh my god. I think the world might explode I, if I got to meet both of you. 
<laughs> I feel like I know everybody from seeing you guys so many times online. That, uh, I know. <laughs> I always we usually have like a shelter behavior hub lunch for my mentees when when I'm at Expo. Oh, that's depending great. on when it yeah, is we'll in May. I'm gonna make a petition. Yeah, we'll be there. Yep. yep. What? All right. My yeah. mom's coming to visit in May from Oregon, so we'll have to see on the timing. But if I am available, that would yeah. be amazing. It's the week of the fifteenth. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's in San Antonio, so yeah, you might be able to make that work. I'm trying to do a road trip back, stop at Pibble Hill on the way. I'm trying to get my husband to take me to Chincoteague, and I know that I was like, if we can get to North Carolina, it's close enough. I'll make Pibble Hill work. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's only like seven hours away. I'm on the far west side of North Carolina, and there. By that, the time my, I'm there, though, <laughs> I know that's not that's on my bucket list too. I, I grew up yes. reading about the ponies of Chincoteague. I'm like, hey. yes. <laughs> um, I was a horse person before I was a dog person, so um, one day I will make that trip too. But yeah, to come to Pibble Hill and meet Theodore because he's old and he's got cancer. And I, I, I if you want to meet him, it, sh it should be soon. He's doing well. He's doing well. He's he looks and, great in all the pictures. Yeah, yeah. I know it's on my bucket on, list. Started him on Lorella, <laughs> so he his arthritis is actually doing better. I didn't think that was a, a reversible thing, but he's he's doing really well. Oh wow, that's, that's very nice. nice. Well, Lauren has has alluded to the adoptability criteria, and I think that's, <laughs> this is something that I know I have I have been on Animal Farm podcasts talking about um, uh -huh. having criteria around what dogs what and what cats are safe to send out and what are not, and that is something that we work on in the mentorship. And I'm working on getting some standalone stuff around behavioral euthanasia, but I kind of feel like you got to know me a little better. <laughs> so it's like week 12 of 13, we, we actually sit down and make a policy. And I think it's super important, whether you've been in sheltering a long time or whether you haven't, to have something written down so that so many times I hear, well, it, it's on a case by case basis. Like you do case by case basis with me, like, the only breeds I have ever repeated in my life are pit bulls and Doberman. So if it's a pit bull or a Doberman, it's going to be harder for me to make the decision. So you need to be able to put your biases aside and say, let's look at the behavior. Let's look at what our population can deal with. Let's look at. And one thing that I ask people to do is look at it every year and the shelters where I have. And I do consulting separately just on creating this piece of policy if, if that's all you need. Um, the last shelter I went back to the second time, what we did was we looked at what I call the outsourced euthanasias, the dogs that we sent mm -hmm. out, it's primarily dogs who did some damage and came back for euthanasia mm -hmm. or who did some damage and, uh, or were otherwise too difficult to live with. And the adopter did the euthanasia because that's, Ouch. that's been a mm -hmm. lifelong pro um, passion project of mine is to make sure we are not doing that to adopters because it doesn't just affect the adopters it affects their friends their family it affects how a lot of people feel about shelter dogs so that is um that is a piece that you get from the mentorship that i think is so important because that that's what leads to burnout it leads to compassion fatigue and behavior people where you're given these impossible projects and they're like be a better trainer make this dog not want to kill other dogs and some sometimes you can't. like there are problems that are too difficult that is the doberman protesting right now <laughs> <laughs> this makes me feel better my dog protested a little while ago so. <laughs> yeah. um the adoptability criteria is hands down the thing that's been the most useful for me both at my last shelter and at my current shelter um you know it's a trend right now it seems like everywhere at least in the united states that we're seeing more and more problematic dogs come through the shelter behaviorally um and where i am in new england it's really not a matter of overpopulation it's a matter of weird population and having those criteria to be able to go down the checklist and say because i'm with trish i have a pit bull obviously i've been following theo for years i have a soft spot in my heart for that breed and they where I live in a, we're in a, a very urban, low income area. So we tend to see a lot of chihuahuas, a lot of pit bulls with behavior problems and being able to go down the list and say, okay, you know, I'm looking at this dog in front of me, but I know this, this, and this is more than what our adopters are able to handle. And it takes the weight off of me to make that decision instead puts it on past Lauren who built these criteria with the help of her amazing manager and director to be able to say, this is the the right choice and it's okay to make this decision because we know that it's the right choice 
Um, and there's gray areas. Ours, I mean, it's definitely a living document. I think my manager and I probably update it once every couple months. A weird case comes in and we're like, oh, I think we're going to see this again. It'll be helpful to let, I mean, we had to figure out what's our policy on semi-feral dogs that we get transferred in from like more rural animal controls. And so it's really helpful again to be able to distance myself from the emotional part of the process and just logically bang through. It sucks and we know this is why. Um, it's a huge, and like I said, I mean, a year and a half into my last shelter, I was so burnt because we were doing case by case basis. The expectation had been that as a dog trainer, I should be able to fix all of these dogs so we don't have to euthanize <laughs> them. Um, and as I'm sure you guys know, when you hire trainers to come into the shelter, your euthanasia rates tend to go up a little bit because it's like, oh no, you guys. No, I don't care if it's an only dog. When he digs under the fence into the neighbor's yard, we're going to have a problem. Um, and so, you know, my current shelter is so much more supportive. It's so helpful to be able to say, like, this is what I'm seeing. Do you guys agree and have everyone with the adoptability criteria be like, yep, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, if you, pre um, if you present that united front, it's not like Lauren hates right. sheep and doodles, and that's why she <laughs> sheep and doodles to be euthanized. It's no, it's the behavior. This is what we can mm -hmm. adopt out. This is what we can't. This is what historically um, tends to do damage in a home and come back anyway. So let's just skip the middleman, and mm -hmm. it's a hard part of the job, and and a lot of us don't want to talk about it, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was something else that made a huge difference in taking your course, Trish, was just the openness with which you talk about what is a consistent and normal process in sheltering. And knowing that I wasn't alone in thinking some of these dogs should not be placed. And in fact, I was far from it. And that it's okay to talk about behavioral euthanasia openly without feeling like I'm a bad person for bringing it up. Something's wrong with me that I would rather euthanize these animals. Instead, it was like, oh, all the stuff I'm feeling inside actually makes sense and being able to frame it from we're sparing adopters trauma. We're sparing the, I mean, my own brother will not adopt dogs from shelter because my first dog had behavior problems. Um, and he saw what I went through with my first dog that I adopted. And even though now I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> I can hook you up with a really great dog. Um, and I don't blame him. He wanted, he has a little kid. He wanted dogs that he could raise himself. But this perception that shelter dogs are all broken comes from people taking it on and adopting these dogs that should not have been family pets. And um, the flip side of that is dogs like Theodore, who is from a dog right. fighting situation and is pretty much perfect, other than a little bit of complaining. Um, he has convinced people to go to a shelter and adopt a pit bull. He has convinced people to give dogs from fighting backgrounds a second chance. Not that they're all like him, but that they can be. And I have four really, really awesome shelter dogs right now. And anytime somebody compliments them in, in public, I'll be like, Madison County Animal Control, they've got other ones like her. <laughs> so um, the, the great dogs that we send out become walking advertisements. And I've had the same experience. I, I didn't even think about it until very recently, but not one single member of my immediate family has gone to a shelter to adopt a pet since my very, very dangerous dog that I inflicted on them in the late 90s. And mm -hmm. he ended up being a behavioral euthanasia. They saw me go through that and they have all sourced animals from different places. And if even meeting my awesome dogs now, um, I, I have destroyed the concept of shelter dogs for my immediate family just with one really scary one. So. Um, keep us sending out nice dogs who will be walking advertisements because there are some amazing dogs in shelters. The dogs that we place at Dakin make me excited when I'm ready for my next dog. I'm like, I'm going to find me such a good shelter dog. <laughs> oh my God, I had a foster here just overnight last week that I was like, oh, oh, if one of you guys dies of old age while this dog's still in the shelter, I <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so so awesome this is why my husband only lets me bring puppies home because he knows i will not take another puppy i'm too tired um, yeah. so he, anytime i call him like puppy he's like yes because after two days i'm like thank you so much for coming goodbye whereas if i were going to take any of these adult dogs home i would be like so i've already named him he has his own name tag and we're keeping him it's great it's amazing the difference and feeling like we get adopters who come back oh i just adopted this dog yes. from you a year ago and now i want him to have a friend you came back to us? Great. 
Let's get them a friend. <laughs> I think it's an important conversation. Uh, we just did a youth a behavior euthanasia podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and I actually quoted Tr- Trish in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so she's so quotable. Too. <laughs> uh, we mentioned how important it is to like to be the this the place for your community to go and adopt dogs. And when you're placing those dangerous dogs, um, like you said, Trish, uh, your you know your family hasn't adopted out a dog uh, from a shelter for that from one from one dog incident, right? In the nineties. Yeah, in the like, 90s, right. <laughs> when I think about how many shelter dogs my immediate family of, you know, there's six of us, there are four kids that could have found homes if he had been like the dogs I have now. I don't know. I don't know how many that would have been, but more than zero, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a great conversation, and I'm so glad that you're having, important conversation, and I, I'm so glad you're having it with all of your your. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the world and with your mentorship program too. You do a lot of work with outside of the mentorship too. My biggest source of burnout was having to feel like I had to keep the behavior euthanasia thing a secret. Um, and talking to Trish about it helped me not only talk to colleagues about it, which, you know, I think more people should take Trish's class so we can have better conversations, but it's gotten me to a space where I can talk to my close friends and family about it. And they do not work in animal care at all. And to be able to have that conversation so that I can get the support I need, you know, hearing Trish talk about it has really helped me reframe it. And now my friends are out there being like, well, you know, these no kill shelters are placing some risky dogs. I'm like, okay, you guys, like, I appreciate you're excited about having this conversation, but let's rein it in and look at every shelter as an individual. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it's neat to see people get on our bandwagon and be like, you should be able to adopt normal rate, like real dogs. Um, and just to be like, I had to make this decision at work today and it was really hard and have them be like, it makes sense why you did that and why it's really hard instead of having to be like, how's work going? And I'm like, uh, (laughs) fine. Thanks for asking. (laughs) I I just posted a podcast, um, on, on my alumni group where they were talking about seeing your Rise, everybody has rising behavioral euthanasia rates these days. I think we are getting more difficult dogs, but the point they made was this this is a sign of our success. This is a sign that we are keeping more dogs in the homes that they are, they were born in and they're not coming in. We don't count those when we keep them in the homes. We only count. So when, when sheltering is at 100%, when we are doing all we can for animals outside of the shelter, we will only be getting the very sick and the very dangerous, and and that means we're doing things perfectly. So, the pressure to have fewer and fewer behavioral euthanasias, uh, medical euthanasias, it's not. Um, if you're doing a good job, actually, it will go up, and it's depressing, and it's hard to think about. And the first person who told me that made my head explode. That was at least a decade ago, but. I, it's a conversation we need to have. That was a really good podcast, too. I shared that with my director at Bacon, and she was like, we should share this with the volunteers. It's like, oh, it's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. It's really reachable for everybody. It was a great podcast. Yeah. yeah. Will you send us that link, too, Trish? Yeah, yeah. I, I am blanking on the name. It's got initials in it. It was the Search and called, Rescue Group. It's, uh, it's The co- podcast is called No Room at the Inn, and I will, I will send you that link so you can share it, because it was a bunch of shelter directors just it just came up in conversation that this should be a sign of success, not of failure and, and really important conversation to have. It was also really cool because listening to it, I was like, hey, two of these people are transfer partners with us. <laughs> and listening to them and being like, I'm really proud that, that we're working with these guys. They're very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the uh, podcast guests has two of my mentees working at her shelter too. So it's I feel like I know people all over the world from from teaching for all these years. It's really great. I love the community that you've built. Uh, very impressive. Yeah, yeah. People will try to get in and be like, "Which which cohort were you in?" And if you can tell me, I can look it up and then <laughs> try to sneak in the back, climb in the I window. Love- <laughs> I love that it's got the same knowledge base going into it. It, it allows us to have a pretty high level of discourse because we're not having to explain conversation-based adoption right. to somebody who's never heard of the concept. At least you've right. been introduced to it. Yeah. 
I am not resilient enough to be on a lot of shelter Facebook groups because of uh, some of the different ways from what I know to be true. Um, and Trisha's group is always a safe space. I never post or read anything there where I'm like, oh God, we have to have the like ooh, conversation. <laughs> Instead, it's like, you guys already know what I'm talking about. So what are you doing here? <laughs> It's, it's yeah, a great huge thing. resource. Years later, it's still given. <laughs> great <laughs> bunch of people. Love my students. Nice. All right. Well, we are going to put all of that information in the show notes, too. So if anybody wants to go check out Trish's course or Lauren Shelter, we'll put some links in there. Um, thank you guys so much. I know we're like went over time here quite a bit, so I hope, <laughs> I hope we're not. Yeah. Thanks for staying yeah. with us. Yeah, yeah, you guys are easy to talk to. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting us. It's always great chatting with you guys, and I will definitely invite you to to the free live chat. So think about talk. Great. You would like to talk to um, the wider sheltering community about. Yeah, absolutely. Bernice, Great. shoot me an email. Let's talk dogs. <laughs> yeah, we're going to come visit like, tomorrow. We'll see yeah, yes. we'll, we'll be there. We're on oh our way. God. You guys, I will give you such a tour. And there's a killer pizza place down the road. So come on oh, down. Right. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we don't have good pizza here. So yeah. yep. I do one place. <laughs> and it's down the road. we have zero. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> it's two hours, guys. Come on down. Just tell me when you're heading yep. out. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. Looking forward to it. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you guys so much.